Do you want a handheld mic or do you want another lavalier mic? Uh, I'll do uh, the I'll two lavaliers. Do you want the third one? Oh, goodness. Those are the cameras that's for the room. Um, I'll do... I'll do a lavalier. I can't, I can't guarantee that I'll remember to hold a handheld mic. Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now okay, how, so do, now I how connect... do I connect? Just put that in your pocket and connect to your shirt. Rather, oh, yeah, one more question. Can you connect into the Wi-Fi, please? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'll start the crowd going. Cool, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, everyone. Welcome to the resurrection of the show. We will try to do it on a more regular basis. Um, if we don't, then we plan to accept it. Yes, that would be better. That is the biggest issue. Getting people to speak. Um, whenever you need a new technology, it's not brand new technology. Getting people to speak is hard. It looks like I'm connected. Yeah, yeah. Great. Say again, say again. It looks like it's connected. Okay. Who is here for the first time? Okay. Say one time. Yes. Who's here is a Julia Cool. Who here is a Julia Google Docs. Where's Google Docs? Who's coming to the Okay, go back to the machine learning meetup. Wow, not enough. Guys, go to the machine learning meetup. It's in this building, the third Thursday. Yeah, this is. This is this will be fine. I mean,
Partly, presumably partly? Did I do it? Okay. okay. This is interesting. Is that? Is that? I'm not I'm sure what, what, what exactly is. This? Oh, that was you. Oh, that was you. Oh. Oh. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Great. Great. Set it up. Okay. Well, in that case, I should figure out how to stop doing whatever I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Okay. You do your thing. You do your thing. Oh, are we, oh are we do we need to get, need back, to get back to the screen? Yeah, screen, screen. Yeah. Okay, okay. Let's go there. Let's go there. Great, great.
Sure. sure. Actually, so Actually, that's, so that's part, part, part. There is a slide about that. Wonderful. Good. We have that. And then for anyone who wants, if it works, we are recording it. It's on the YouTube live stream right now, hopefully. And if that works, then you'll have it up on the YouTube page. And you can go in there. Our talk there will be Julia Fox going forward. Feel free to check it out. Hopefully, it's good quality. So with that, this is a new state of the game. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And thank and you thank all for you coming, all out. coming out. Uh, I'm really, I'm really excited, excited to be here. To be here. This, is, this, is, this is lovely. lovely. So, so uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, know my name is David Gold. Gold. I, am I am a PhD, a PhD student, student in the Department, in the Department of, Statistics of Statistics at the University, at the University of Washington. Of Washington. And, and ostensibly, ostensibly when, I'm when I'm not doing Julia, Julia development, development, I am I supposed am to be supposed working with Johannes Lederer to develop estimators and inference methodology for high dimensional models. And, and I, got I got started programming, started programming in, Julia, in Julia and kind of started, started programming in general, general about a year and a half ago, ago when, when through this, this interesting, interesting confluence of events, I worked, worked on nullableArrays.jl for a, a Julia Summer of Code project, project at, the at the Recurse Center, Center which, which actually, actually uses uh, uh, that, that office, office over there, over there to host, host uh, speakers, uh, speakers and, and give seminars. So it's pretty cool to be back here in the eBay office. And, and okay, okay, about this about talk. talk. Uh, there, uh, are two, there are two, two main two threads, threads that I'm going to, to, to go over. The first, first describes my work this summer at, at the Julia, Julia Labs, Labs at MIT, at MIT developing, developing this package, package structured quail. Uh, uh, I, I, I wrote a blog, blog post that's, that's far too, far too long, long about, about it, and, and it can be found here. here. I'll make the slides available so you can go check it out. And I'll also be talking a little bit more about tabular data support in Julia. Slightly, slightly more generally. More generally. In, particular, in particular, I'll be talking, talking about some about changes that are coming, that are coming to data, data frames, frames and, and how the how work that I've done, done, I've done this past summer and are continuing to do uh, uh, plays in with that. that. And, and the main, the main takeaway, takeaway is that, is that there, are there are fits and starts, starts I think, I with, with uh, data, frames data frames in Julia. But, but on the whole, we're making progress. I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited for where it's going. And I look forward to what we have for when Julia 1.0 is released. Uh, so, so, a note, a note everything, everything that follows that is follows subject to change. change. Uh, this, uh, this is describing, describing a work in progress, work in progress and, and I'm, I'm one of the reasons, the reasons why I was really excited, excited to give this, to give talk, this talk is because, is because I, would I would love feedback, feedback from everybody in the audience, in the audience everybody, everybody who's, who's uh, watching, watching, just if you have, if you have thoughts, thoughts about things that you see, things that you think could be improved, I'm all ears, love to hear it. Uh, also, also, I realize I that I've been steeped, steeped in all of this, this for the past, past however many months, months and, and so if there's so anything that's, that's unclear, unclear to you, uh, because, uh, because I might be assuming, might be assuming a certain, certain background, background that's not generally, generally had, please, please raise, raise your hand, hand and, and ask, ask a question. question. I'll be happy to entertain those during and after, after the talk. talk. Okay, so what is structured queries? It is a package whose goal is to represent the structure of a query with a directed acyclical graph object. And by query, I mean uh, query as in SQL or just a series of manipulations applied to data as in dplyr. And so, big question, why would you want to do something like this? And I facetiously listed and crossed it out two reasons why you, know, you might want to. One, everybody's using DAGs, right? They're all the rage, so we should use them too. Uh, second, uh, second, DAG, DAG are, my are my initials, and, and I am a narcissist. narcissist. Uh, neither, neither of those, those two points two are points hopefully are true. true. The real the reason, reason why, why uh, we would uh, be interested in such a project, project is because, because representing, representing a query with a, a, a graphical, graphical uh, a graph object, object allows, allows us to, to make queries generic, generic over, over multiple backends. backends. First, First and foremost, foremost we can. We can compile, quote unquote, those, unquote, those, those queries, queries or those objects, objects down, down to, to Julia code Julia for dealing with in-memory in Julia, Julia tables, tables uh, or, or we can generate, generate SQL, SQL from, them, from them, for instance. And as, and far, as, as far as the Julia, Julia table, table support goes, goes there, are there are interesting things that we can do, we can do uh, with, a with a query framework, framework that represents that queries abstractly in order to solve a couple of problems that have been plaguing data frames in general for, I think, years. So I'll talk more about those later on. And, and they have to they do have with to do type inferability. And, and now that data frames is going to be built, built on top of nullable, nullable arrays, arrays, how to how solve, solve lifting problem, how, how, how to solve the problem, problem uh, of, of making, making nullables, nullables usable. usable. So I'll talk, I'll a, talk bit a bit about those too. too. So, so an example, example of, of what this what package is about. about. So suppose we consider the much belabored iris data set. 
and we can and load, load into data, data frames, frames as, as such, such using, using Jehu Quinn's, Quinn's very handy data, data streams and CSV packages, packages, which are which awesome. awesome. So we have, so we have this IRA data set. It is a data frame. frame. I will I note that, that I am using, using data, data frames master, master right, right now, now and, and that, that is uh, reflects, reflects the transition, the transition to, to switching, switching to nullable, nullable arrays as backend, backend support, support for data frame columns. columns. So, so if you want to play with this, this, I welcome you to. I've tried to design this Jupyter notebook in such a way that you can just run things, run things and follow and prompts and follow, and follow along, along, but do but so at your own risk. risk. Okay, so we have this data set. Suppose we want to restrict to rows whose value for a certain field, say sepal length, is greater than 7.5. How do we do, How do that? We do that? Well, well, in the native, in the native API, API for data frames, frames, one way to do this is by indexing, indexing into the data frame, data frame with a, a, uh, a, column, a column of zeros and, zeros and ones, ones that we can that generate, we generate by broadcasting, broadcasting uh, this, this predicate, predicate greater than 7.5 over, over the column, the column iris, iris uh, uh, sepal length. length. And, and this works. This works. It's, it's, it has its ups and downs. Uh, for, uh, one, for one, it's, it's nice, nice not to have to write, to write iris, iris over, and over and over and over, and, and, over and the more predicates that you get, the more, get, the more times you have to write iris. iris. It relies on broadcasted on operators, operators. Uh, so, uh, so it's not, not it's a bit, it's more, a bit more accessible, accessible now, now that we have the concise broadcasting, broadcasting syntax, syntax, but still it would be nice, nice to be able to just work in terms of scalar operators if that's what you want to do. Uh, there's, uh, another there's another package, package data, frames data frames meta, which, which is, is kind of a kind pioneering of approach, approach to, to data, data manipulation, manipulation with data, data frames, frames using macros. macros. Uh, I, won't I won't talk too much, about, much this, about this, but this, but this would be, be the solution, the solution to, to this particular, particular data, data manipulation problem, problem using data, data frames meta. meta. So, so it's, it's, uh, a, it's a nice, nice concise nice syntax. syntax. You don't have to repeat iris over and over. It does rely on broadcasted operators. And it's and also, it's also tightly, tightly coupled, coupled to, to the data, data frames, frames implementation. implementation. So it's so not it's generic, generic over multiple, multiple backends. backends. In structured, In structured queries, queries, what I've, I've done, done is offered, offered this, this or provided this at query macro. macro. So using, so using at query, you can, you can create, create this context where you can describe a series of manipulations of your data. data. And, and the result, the result of, this of this is a query object that wraps, wraps a, graphical a graphical structure or a graphical representation, representation of your query. Of your query. So, so you see, see we use at query, query with, with this, this very familiar, familiar filter, filter syntax. syntax. And, and we are returned we are a query object, object and we can inspect, inspect the graph the of that query by calling graph. graph. And the and graph, graph says, says okay, okay, we have this node, this node that represents, that represents the, the filtering, filtering operation, operation and, and input, input into, into that node or fed into that node is just, just a data, data source. source. Okay, okay, cool. cool. Now what now do what I do, do with, do with my, my query once I have it? Do I take it for walks? Do I feed it? What do I what do I do with a query? So one thing you can do with a query is extend it to produce more queries. So if you query a query, that will extend it. You can see that we can Add an, add an additional, additional select, select operation, operation to, it to it by using the same, same syntax. syntax. The, the query, op op the at query, query macro, macro also, also supports, supports piping, piping for readability. For readability. And, we and we see it produces, produces a new a query, query that, that whose graph, graph now reflects the fact that we have, we have uh, asked, asked to, to project, project onto, onto species, species and petal width. width. You can use this composability of queries in conjunction with functions. And that is nice, nice for modularizing, modularizing your queries. queries. So you so can, can decide, decide, you can, you can use this to, to query, produ or, produce or produce a query, a query that can be uh, collected, collected against, against different backends. Back I won't get into that too much. too much. And skip and ahead and set to, to the, the exciting, exciting bit. bit. Yes. yes. When using structured queries, is there, I understand that, that maybe this would go against relational data frames, but are there other stuff? Is there a particular So the question is, if I might paraphrase, what, what is, is, are there, is there a well-defined well set of backends back for which, for which uh, this, uh, this query, query framework, framework will work, work and not work? work. Uh, uh, I want to break, break that, that or, or my answer, answer to that will be in two parts. parts. And, and we're kind of coming to this. The query framework itself can be applied to anything. So you can represent a query against anything. Uh, but, uh, then but then the, the question, question of, of if you try, if you try to, collect to collect a query, a query against, against anything, anything, will that, that work, work uh, is, uh, a, is separate a separate point. point. Uh, 
So, so you can you query, query anything, anything and, collect and collect against anything for which there is some uh, support. Uh, support. So if so you're if asking, you're asking in, principle, in principle, does there does need, there to, need be to be data representation? In principle, in principle, in principle uh, uh, there aren't really any restrictions, restrictions other than, than uh, data, uh, data sources, sources for which, which it makes, makes sense, sense to, represent to represent such, such queries, queries against. against. So, uh, okay. Okay. So, so the obvious, the obvious use case is tables, tables tabular, tabular data, data structures. structures. Part, of Part of what's nice, nice about this about syntax, syntax uh, about, this about this interface, interface is that, that you can, can talk, talk directly, directly about, about uh, attributes, attributes of a, ta of a, of a, of a table. table. So, for so instance, here, here we are not, not. We don't need, we don't to, need to refer to. to uh, Iris, uh, Iris more than, more than once, once, we can we just can say, say, we're talking, talking about, about Iris, that creates that an environment in which we can talk about um, the, attributes the attributes of this, of this table. table. In, general, in general, there's no, there's reason, no reason why, why such, such a framework, framework couldn't, couldn't support, support a more link-like link -like functionality, functionality in which you can just, can just say, okay, okay, I have I an have iterator, iterator, and now I want to talk about elements of this iterator, and specify manipulations in terms, in terms of, of these elements, elements and then, and then define, define some semantics, semantics for, for collecting, collecting such a such query. query. So, so part, part of my answer, answer to this question, question is uh, the, the query, query framework, framework and the collection, and the collection framework, framework are decoupled, decoupled in the sense that, that the query framework, framework is designed to just represent, represent a query, a query. And, then and then it's up to somebody, somebody to implement, implement something and, and, and decide what are the, what semantics, are the semantics that make that sense, sense here. here. What does what it does mean, mean to, to say select, select petal width from, from iris? Well, in well, the case of a table, that's fairly straightforward. But you can imagine more exotic data structures where you might have multiple semantics that would that make would sense, sense for filter. filter. OK. okay. And, and did you have a question? Have a question? OK. OK. In uh, your queries, are any, you have the functional examples of the rapid for query. Is there any way to use functional examples for each other? Instead of SQL, uh, make the query with 7.5, uh, people in the square or some functional form of that or whatever you have to use. We will get, we'll to, get that. to that. So the question, so the question is, is uh, what uh, sort of manipulations, manipulations to, to, say, say attributes, attributes like SQL like length, length or pedal width can you, can you apply? apply? And, and I hope, I hope that will that become, become clear, clear shortly. shortly. And if not, if please, please ask again. Ask again. Okay. okay, so, so this, is this is kind of, I think, of getting, getting to, to art. art? Uh, no, no. This is kind of, pardon me, what is your name, sir? Jeffrey, I think this is, this is, I hope, getting to Jeffrey's question. So I've shown you can extend a query by querying against it again. Uh, I'll throw out that I understand that the word query is kind of one of those words that once you repeat it over and over, it starts to lose its meaning, and I appreciate all of your bearing with me. Uh, you can also, as you would hope to be able to do, materialize a query as some in-memory Julia object. And the, and the way that, way that, I, that I've, that I've uh, designed uh, that, that framework to work is by is using, using collect. collect. So, so here, here we, we go to go collect, to collect Q, Q, the query that we, that we inst uh, instantiated, instantiated earlier against, against Iris, Iris, and we and see, we see oh, oh, we don't have we don't a, have a there's, no there's no backend support, support yet for that, that specified. specified. We have we to have load to some load package, package that, that, decide, that, that, that provides the semantics, semantics for what it means to collect such a query against a table like Iris. Uh, so uh, there's, so another there's another package, package that, that is, is unregistered, unregistered and, and is tentatively, is tentatively named, named collect, collect, and, and it, does it does just, just that. that. So we so load we this load package. package. This package, this package has, has a well-defined well semantics, semantics for, for gives a well-defined well semantics, semantics to collecting, collecting a, query a query against, against say, a table, a table like Iris. Iris. And, and it does what exactly what you would expect it to. It returns all the rows for which this predicate is satisfied. Right. right, so, so this, this is the, the, the collect, collect machinery, machinery, the thing, the thing that, that makes collecting, collecting this query against, against Iris, Iris run, run is, is defined, defined in terms of a abstract, abstract table type, type which has its, its own, own interface, interface and any uh, object, uh, object satisfying, satisfying this interface, interface will then uh, get, get support, support for queries against, against or, or support, support for, for query collection, collection against, against such, such types. types. Uh, uh, so the, so the 
question, question for, for anybody, anybody who couldn't who hear that before was, was uh, what, what sorts, sorts of, of what sorts of types are support? Or, or, yes. yes. What is what the, the scope of types again for which, which uh, collection, uh, collection, such collection is supported? Is it just, just data, data frames, frames other in memory Julia table, table objects? objects? And, the and the answer is right, right now it's anything that satisfies, satisfies a certain, certain interface, interface, which is the is subject, the subject for, for another talk. talk. Uh, would you repeat the question, please? You want to change your name. That's to I'm totally ha open to that. I'm 100% open to that. Open to that. that makes a lot of sense. I'm entirely open to naming suggestions. I, I don't claim to excel on that point. <laughs> Okay, okay, so, so uh, whatever, whatever the package, package name is, is uh, it, it will be structured in such a way so that you don't have to load more than one package. package. You just, just load one package, package whatever collection machinery you are using will re-export this query, query interface, interface and, and everything, everything will just, just be simple, simple for the user. user. Uh, there's, uh, there's also, also a, convenience a convenience macro at collect, which does collection and querying in a single go, so you don't have to query and then collect which is which nice is for in-memory in tabular, tabular data structures, structures like data frames. Data frames. Uh, uh, with, with things, things that don't necessarily, necessarily fit in memory, memory it's, it's nice to have, have this layer of querying, querying first, first, I think. think. So, so I don't want I don't to get into the weeds too much, too much but, I but I think this, this is kind of important, important for the talk, talk for, for the part, part, part of the talk, if we get to it at first time, about the just tabular frameworks in Julia in general. And the main point that I want to stress here is that both is that this, 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 this collection, collection machinery works, works by essentially uh, transforming, transforming a data frame into an iterator over tuples, tuples and then say, say mapping, mapping this predicate over those tuples. tuples. So, really so really what we what need is we need fast, fast iteration from, from a data frame. frame. That's really That's important, important to making data manipulation in Julia work. That's over rows of data frames. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question, and it's something that I have. So the question is, uh, it does how does row versus column precedence influ influence or impact performance? And that's a really good question that I is that would that be inaccurate? And that's a really good question that I haven't explored yet. So Tom's, Tom's point, point is that, if I'm understanding, understanding correctly, is that uh, suppose, suppose you only you want, want to so end up projecting onto two columns from a, da from a data frame that has like 10,000 columns. You don't, you don't want, want to zip together 10,000 columns or any more, num any more than the columns that you'll need. Uh, and currently, that optimization isn't a part of the collection machinery, but it's certainly something that I've thought about and I intend to implement and include. But it's a good point. So the way I understand it is, uh, I think if I'm understanding Jeffrey's collection or question, collection question, too many, too many cues and right exactly. If I'm understanding Jeffrey's query correctly, uh, this has to do with uh, so when we're performing these sorts of operations, does it help to have a columnar or a row-wise memory layout? Is that yeah? And yeah. so, so it's, it's, all, it's, it's, it's about the memory layout of the data. data. And, and the question, question is, there, there, so, so we, we have two possible memory layouts. layouts. Which one's better for these sorts of, uh, of operations? operations? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> the columns together. You're zipping, so you're zi zipping in general takes two iterators, or yeah. 
And so you're zipping just columns, and then when you iterate over that resultant zipper, zip iterator, you get tuples that are uh, elements of the data frame, just rows. All right. You are, so I don't want to get too into the weeds here. The main, the main thing, uh, and I'm happy to talk about this afterwards. I want to go a little bit further. Uh, but the main point to take away is that if we're going to make any of this worthwhile, we need fast iteration over tuples that are somehow generated from a data frame. Uh, this is just, these slides are just about show, just show how all the things that we need for doing this operation, the filtering predicate uh, and some other things are stored in the query graph itself. So this is this graph right here is not just pretty printing of the query, it also holds all of the information that we need, all the data that we need uh, in order to conduct the query by iterating over rows of the data frame. So once we get that graph straightened out, and have all of those, all that data we need in there, it's more or less just a matter of extracting it in a systematic fashion and iterating over rows from a data frame. So I mentioned the whole, one of the points of this is to be backend agnostic. That's actually not something that I've so much been focused on, uh, but Yizian at the, um, at MIT in the Department of Operations Research has been doing some cool work on this and I direct you all to this package SQL query and particularly this pull request in which we are working together to make his query translation or his translation of these query graphs into SQL uh, a reality. That is unfortunately the most I will say about translation into SQL at this point in time, but I'm happy to entertain questions about it later. Well, you don't need to know about it, right? It's just magic. You just <laughs> your queries and you never think One would hope. One would hope, but I, I'll have to think. <laughs> okay, so we've shown filter, using this query framework to filter. What else can I do with this? What other commands are supported? Uh, so you can, this is speaking to, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name. Graydon. What is it? Graydon. Graydon. So Graydon asked earlier, what sorts of transformations can we cite inside of the query? And so hopefully this gives you some sort of a sense, and it's basically arbitrary ar operations. Um, you can multiply columns by two. You can take di gamma the log of something, and I don't know why you'd want to, but you can. Uh, I don't have support for control flow in there yet. You can use if else, but things like ternary operator won't work, but there's no reason in principle why they couldn't be. There's no reason why in principle any Julia code couldn't become uh, part of a, say, a scalar transformation that you operate uh, that you apply row by row. Would that extend to Sure. I mean, that's what digamma and log are. They're no, they're no different than user-defined function. Oh, so the, qu the question is, could you define your own user function f of whatever and apply it inside of a query? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely. So there's also support for grouping and aggregation. Uh, if, you've, if, all, if you all have ever used dplyr, this syntax will be very familiar to you. The, um, the printing is not quite as pretty because what happens when you group a data frame or any um, in-memory Julia tabular data object that satisfies the interface uh, that the collection machinery is built off of, it wraps that object in this grouped wrapper, which holds index information about which row observations fall into which groups, and there's just not pretty HTML printing for such a thing. But as you can see, you can group by and then apply aggregating functions over the group, and there's no set list of aggregating functions that work and don't work. It's just anything that maps a column to a scalar, you can safely apply, and it will do the right thing in principle. Joins. There is basic support for inner joins. So we have one data frame. We make another data frame. We join them together on A1 equals A2. Uh, there's also support for joining on more complex equijoins. So for instance, we can say, a, you know, join on A1 equals this 
predicate of b of b2. And right now, the implementation of joins only supports equijoins, but of course, I hope to expand that in the near future. So issues and to-dos. So one thing is name resolution, which I didn't really talk about too much in the previous slides, but as you, as you can see, um, names inside of a query are assumed to be, at this point, fields of a tabular data object, which going back to Jeffrey's point is not entirely general as far as the sorts of things that could become, a query, become the object of a query. It also kind of messes up name resolution a little bit uh, because the general pattern is functions that are called within a manipulation verb, like summarize, for instance, those are parsed, uh, or those are, those are inherited from the enclosing scope. So we inherit reduce from the enclosing scope because it's a function that's being called on objects. Uh, sepal length is an argument to a function, or rather it's just something that's not being, it's not a, it's not a function call, and so it's assumed to be a, a field inside of a table. And that's parsed correctly. But then plus, which is not a field of the iris table, is still parsed to be a field of the iris table, so that's wrong. So you couldn't do this as such. This naive query would not give you the right thing. You would have to interpolate uh, in this symbol to make sure that this querying framework knows that plus isn't, the at, isn't an attribute of some table, it's a, um, it's a name from the enclosing scope. Conversely, if you had a column of functions and you wanted to do, say, select f of a, where f is um, the name of that app, is the name of that column of functions, that wouldn't parse collect correctly. It would look for f in the enclosing scope as opposed to as the as opposed to looking for it as an attribute of the table. So both of those things are unsatisfactory, and they can be solved with some sort of interpolation syntax, but it's it kind of rubs me the wrong way to say that sometimes names of functions are parsed correctly and sometimes, or sometimes they're parsed as uh, from the enclosing scope and sometimes they're parsed as attributes of a table. I'm not super fond of that. I hope that there, I, I, I would like there to be a solution that uh, doesn't involve that. So, so that's one issue. It relates to what I list down here, interpolation slash parameterized queries. I'll kind of skip that. And then implementation-wise, uh, make everything fast, make everything better. There's this really cool, uh, Jamie Branton wrote a really cool blog post about a really interesting project in which he demonstrates that you can write a very performant uh, relational query compiler entirely in Julia. So why not do that? That should be, that, something like that there's no reason something like that shouldn't be driving uh, querying against a data frame to the best of our abilities. Where is that found? Say again? Where, where does one find this write-up? Uh, one finds, uh, one just follows these links, <laughs> which, I, which I will make available. But if you want to, uh, if, you, if, if, you, if, if you're in, yes. yeah. <laughs> uh, go, to, go, go to scatteredthoughts.net. And I think as of right, scattered-thoughts.net. And I believe as of right now, the write-up about his relational query compiler will be the second blog post. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. By, 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 by uh, you know, I think there's definitely an argument. So um, Tom's point is, well, in, for instance, data frames meta, you prefix attributes with colons. Uh, in other words, you somehow designate what names in the, in the scope of your query are supposed to refer to attributes of a table. I think that's actually a good idea. I think. Um, you know, in dplyr, you don't do that, but dplyr has delayed evaluation on its side, so it can actually tell what's the name of from a table and what's not. We can't, 
I was thinking, my original thought was make something that's entirely as convenient as dplyr, but if it introduces these weird rules or inconsistencies, then maybe it's not as convenient, and it's time to go back to something that forces you to designate what's an attribute and what's not. Yeah, so I mean, there are no easy answers here to trade off versus of convenience versus consistency in name resolution. Uh, it's not yet really clear to me what is going to be most important in the Julia data science world. I don't think we, we don't have enough, we don't have enough data points. Where are the benchmarks? Um, Shifty eyes face, and I know show. So the, the answer is I don't, I don't have benchmarks here, uh, and I know that showing up to a Julia meetup without benchmarks is like showing up to a party without, I guess beer. I was going to say I am a graduate student, so I don't go to parties. But yes, like beer is the obvious fallback. It's like showing up to a party without beer. But what I will say is that um, at this point in the development of this collection machinery, the main thing that I was interested in is uh, just getting something that's type, type inferrable. Right? Uh, at a minimum, to write to, for our Julia code to be performant, it needs to be type inferrable. And in this case, that means that iteration over whatever is generating our tuples of rows needs to be type inferrable. And there's some preliminary work in John Miles White's notes way back from the beginning of the summer that show that this is the case. And if you actually go and inspect the code, you know, throw at, or at code warn type in various places in the implementation, it will show that indeed the, uh, the, the parts of the code that we want to be type inferrable are type inferrable. And so that gets us at least the first step towards the most performant implementation of query support that we can. Afterwards, right, there's a lot of stuff that, for instance, uh, Jamie Brandon is worrying about in his uh, imp project, which is getting Julia to produce really efficient code in terms of what, get, what gets boxed, what doesn't get boxed, whether or not closures are type in, or uh, whether or not names from closures are type inferrable and whatnot. And those, those are a lot of subtleties that I haven't gotten to and that are, yes, complicated, pushing my ability. But I'm excited to go and look at them more closely. So long story short on performance, uh, we've checked off the first box. There are more boxes to check off before it's worthwhile making interesting comparisons. So there were comments. There are comments about um, the interface and about name resolution, about mostly about name resolution, um, and that's something that I've been thinking a lot about late, lately. There are also comments about uh, what sorts of objects does it make sense to query, and the interface is part is the interface uh, is part of that. If the interface assumes makes assumptions about the structure of your data in terms of whether or not it has attributes, then arguably that restricts the set of things that you can query with it. So I've thought about those issues and um, been I've been working on a, a new interface or a revised interface um, that I suppose makes obsolete everything that I've just shown you, so I don't know if that was a really good idea, but I mean, part of, part of, I mean, part of why I am keeping this presentation is because I genuinely want feedback. This isn't all a, a sure thing. You know, you can tell me I like the old one better, I like the new one better. Um, I hope that you all will help me steer the direction of this interface. So without further ado, this is what it looks like. So we have a data frame, uh, and it relies on this, this width macro. And it kind of introduces this. Yeah. That ends up looking a lot like uh, David Antoff's package and query.jl, which is very much inspired by link. It takes a lot from link. It kind of looks like a mutt, right? It's kind of like a mix between link and dplyr. Um, I think there are some nice things about it. There are some weird things about it. But I think it's at the very least interesting. So this is what I like about it. I like that name resolution. Well, um, 
Okay, so yes, I mentioned it's very much inspired by Link and Query.jl. Query.jl is uh, a package by David Antoff that does stuff very similar to what Structured Queries does. And I think he uh, was inspired by a lot of very powerful things in Link that I would like to incorporate. So that's part of what's driving the suggestion of this interface. I also kind of just like hacking the do syntax. I like that notion. Um, so what are, what are the potential upsides? Um, well, oh, so it also supports this kind of cute little uh, inline syntax, uh, right, where you don't have the do block, you just say with table verb, which conceptually to me makes sense. Um, so by the way, the question, there is a question, or I think there should be a question, there probably is a question, what the heck is going on with this uh, table of I? So this syntax is just introducing I as sort of a token uh, that represents an arbitrary row in the data in the in your data, an arbitrary element of your data when considered as an iterator that you can then refer to in verbs that act element by element. So it's becoming a little bit more general in terms of the, in terms of what sorts of data sources it's able to talk about, because now you're not talking about um, a data source in terms of attributes, or necessary, you're not forced into talking about a data source in terms of attributes. You can talk about a data source as an, it's just an iterator, and I can talk about an arbitrary element of this iterator. So it produces a graph as before, and again, this graph contains everything that we need to enact query or to collect queries over this thing. So the graph is the thing, and then implementation follows. Uh, it also, so, Again, one of the advantages is that it ties attributes to data sources. It makes whatever source an attribute is coming from very clear. And so this can be used when you are, say, parsing filter clauses or where clauses into joins. So for instance, not, you can uh, say, I have two tables as my sources. I assign the first one this I row token, and the second one, this J row token, and these are my filter clauses. Yes, so exactly. So it's kind of like using a single where clause in SQL to filter and join, and it produces a graph that it reflects precisely that. Question. Right. So the question is, um, with this syntax, or could this syntax support uh, window functions? And my answer is, it could very well support them. It doesn't currently. It doesn't currently. But actually, if we go a few slides later, so this is just showing that you can, I don't know, write fairly complicated filter clauses, relatively complicated. Maybe not all that complicated if you're a SQL programmer and you're like, Psh, but. Um, they break down into arguably something worthwhile. Okay, so advantages. One advantage is uh, precisely as I'm afraid I forget your name, Philip. As Philip was asking about window functions, could it be used to provide a syntax for window functions? And the answer is absolutely it could be. So for here, for instance, where we want to Restrict to all observations i from iris whose value for sepal length is greater than you know, the mean of, well, I'm not even going to bother writing it out, but the point is that you can refer to a window using, or could in theory refer to a window by just using a regular um, comprehension syntax. Thank you. Have a good one. So does that answer your question? Yes. Sure. Actually, I mean, in principle, sure. I haven't tested it. <laughs>
Right. I would, the, the thing that I envision for that would be instead of j.sql length for j in iris, da, 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 I would just do um, j.sql length for j in like i minus 5 to i, where i is this present index. Of that, of that like um, reference index. Yeah. Yeah, so it, is, it, it, would be, it would refer to a row in uh, the iterator in this case, just the iterator over uh, the rows of a data frame. And then, uh, yes. <laughs> I guess um, I guess there is a bit of sleight of there would be a bit of sleight of hand going on with that with with that uh, with that syntax, where in general I means the refers to the row of the iterator, but then if you're using it in say like a unit range, it gets interpreted as like the numeric index in the current sorted order. Does that help to answer the question? Thank you. Or, or you're welcome, whatever I'm supposed to say. <laughs> uh, how am I on time? OK, a little bit more time. So those are some of the advantages, disadvantages. There's additional complexity. Um, you have to specify these row token things everywhere. Um, there's a little bit of additional complexity for me, the developer. There's a question of the syntax. Why is my data source now a function call? That's weird. What's going on there? Who do you think you are? Um, and then there's a bit of abuse for uh, dot for referencing a field name. That could be solved with name tuples. Um, that would be nice. If you had an iterator that just produced named tuples, then dot could just mean get field like it normally does. There is a name tuple package. I've thought about using it. There's a fair amount of metaprogramming involved in getting that to work out correctly. And I'm also, I would like to not have to modify global state in order to iterate over something. That would be nice. But it's definitely something that I've considered or considered you know, rolling my own also so that I'm not dependent on one more external package whose future I don't, I, I'm not sure of. Um, but, but yes, there is a name tuples package, and it's pretty cool. Tom. Um, just a, a suggestion. It, it might be a little nicer syntax-wise if, if you reference, instead of TBL or an I, you just, it's just TBL, and mm -hmm. then you reference TBL dot uh, inside the body of it. Yeah. Um, It's referring to the current. No, I'm not, uh, I know. Right, right, right. right. But I'm saying, like, for some yeah, yeah. Although then, then of course, course, then of course, course yeah. Of course, course, then you lose things like, like the window, window function syntax and and and, and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Sure. The, the other, other thing, thing is that arguably, t you know, tbl dot attribute could could be taken to refer to like the whole column. So suppose so one of the things I like about this i dot syntax is that it provides you a way of talking about the, the, the current value for a field as opposed to maybe something like TBL dot attribute where you talk about the column as a whole, which you could use in, uh, you could use in say, uh, an aggregate function. Right, so maybe there's some other separator that you could distinguish between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's, yeah, there's definitely, it's, an, it's, a, it's a good con suggestion. And that's, I'm, and I'm happy for it. <laughs> Um, so it's kind of late, and this uh, the rest of the rest of this talk was going to be about how data frames is transitioning towards using nullable arrays instead of data arrays, and the reason for this is precisely because that is, is precisely that data arrays do not provide type inferable iteration. They provide very not type inferable, actually not not very type uninferable index iteration, but they provide marginally type uninferable iteration, and 
again, if we're going to make a uh, manipulation framework based on iterating over a data framework worthwhile, we need type inferable iteration at the very least. Um, the thing is that as soon as you start building data frames on top of nullable arrays, you have nullables flying everywhere. And there's a host of problems that you incur when you introduce nullables, specifically that all of your original methods that were defined on null nullable values no longer work. So you need to find some way of making that work. So the rest of the talk was going to be about how uh, such a query framework could be used to alleviate those, those concerns or, or just like ameliorate that situation. If people should, oh. What's that? The punchline is that, okay, so the punchline is that, um, the punchline is that, okay, we get method errors when we try to use our normal functions on nullables. What do we do about this? There are a couple of things we could do. One, we can just define all the methods again, right? So we def define times for nullables, plus for nullables, define all of your favorite methods for nullables. Um, and then, then it all works. Of course, that's a lot of methods to define. And it's also, it's, so it's not very general. And um, you can either continuously maintain a collection of extended methods for nullables, and every time somebody comes across uh, something that's not currently supported and throws a method error, you add a lifted definition into this repository of lifted method definitions. Uh, here I'm using the word lifted with abandoned, but I'll explain it later on. Um, so you could do that. Uh, there are also, you could also define a core subset, like a core set of lifted method definitions, and then hope that everything else is defined generically and can generically rely on those the, uh, core subset of lifted methods. When I say lifted methods, I just mean methods that are defined over nullables and will do what you want them to do, i.e. return nullable of the value you expect when the arguments are not null and return null when any of the arguments are null. So you could do that. Um, you could also define a higher order function, call it lift, which takes any function and any arguments, be they nullable or non-nullable, and does the right thing with them. So this is uh, more general, and it can be made, made performant now that we have high performance, uh, perf now that anonymous functions or functions passed as arguments are performant in Julia 0.5, uh, we can make this performant. It's general. You can give uh, proper syntax or proper semantics to things like um, three-value logic with it. The downside is that you have to write lift everywhere, which is you know arguably really good practice if you're a statistician and you want to be explicit about how you're handling null values, and it's a real pain in the ass for everything else. And arguably, I mean, there's a case to be made that, okay, if you're doing an analysis, then you should, you know, be made to be explicit about how you're handling null values. But if you're just doing manipulations of your data, you should be able to rely on transformations that can handle null values in a smart way. Because for the most part, the rule is pretty clear. If arguments are null, return null. If not, return what you would expect. Okay, so we have these two strategies. One of them seems a lot like the vectorization problem that we had with vectorized functions in Julia that was solved with an efficient broadcasting syntax. Uh, the other strategy, use a higher order function that's really cumbersome to write. So my point is the punchline is that, okay, if we're using macros to provide a query manip or a data manipulation a query framework, and these, ma these macros um, manipulate user expressions anyway, we can use them to transform the call graph of any user specified functions to just lift everything, transform f of x's to lift f of x's everywhere. So that's a thing we can do. It has some drawbacks because, for instance, uh, you, have, you might have functions that have non-standard lifting semantics like three-valued logic. And since this is a purely syntactic transformation, only operators that are visible to the macro performing that transformation can be transformed. So for instance, if we have this very simple data frame like this, and wait a minute, which is, okay. We have a simple data frame like this. Uh, the macro can see this operator. 
So it can transform it into a lift of or a comma b, and that will give you the proper three value logic semantics. But then if you were to do something like this, f of x, y equals x or y, and then do this user define, and then filter by this user defined function, it gives you something different because the macro can't look inside of the definition of f and see that you've used this thing that has non-standard lifting semantics. It just sees, okay, f, I apply standard lifting semantics to that, and that gives you a different result, which is not ideal. That's kind of a, kind of a gotcha and could be problematic. You could just make this really, really explicit in bold letters at the top of the package. If you're going to rely on three-valued logic, um, explicitly pass all such operators to the macro. So the point is that this is a thing that we can do to make nullables more useful. There, are, there is no perfect solution, I don't think, except for one that might not be doable, which is to basically, um, if you have a function called on an argument signature where any of the arguments are nullable or of a type similar to nullable that we decide ought to propagate nulls automatically, then, the co then whatever code lowering mechanism uh, is active should just lower to lift f, of, lift f over arguments. And so that would not be a matter of dispatch, it would just be a matter of code generation. I have no idea if this is feasible. I was really hoping somebody would be here today who could tell me either this is feasible, uh, it will take a lot of work, or this is totally unfeasible and you should just forget it. So if anybody has strong feelings about this, I'd love to hear it. But anyway, so that's, that's the, hmm? Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. So that's ultimately the punchline about nullables is that uh, we kind of need them for generating efficient iterative code and we don't really know how to make them usable in, in, a, gen, in a general extensible and user-friendly way. But we're working on it and I think we're making progress. Um, from my very, very, very limited, under so the question is, are you trying to just use monads? And my, is, that's not quite the question. Uh, yeah, so the, the, yes, I would agree with that insofar, in, Insofar as I have a very limited understanding of what monads are, I will agree with that. Basically, like, basically, we have this set of functionality defined on a certain domain, and there's this parallel universe um, where the functionality is systematically, or we want the functionality in the parallel universe to be systematically derived from the functionality in the base universe, uh, which I kind of it sounds like that, that's that's kind of what monads do. Okay, so. That's, that's the situation, and yes, basically we don't really know what, what aspects of the language will best be able to handle this. It's not yet clear. Um, this was a joke about writing, you know, or we could just forget about nullables altogether. We could wait for somebody to special case small union types to be, make them performance, or we could just go back to data arrays and um, write code like broadcast for data arrays, which just uses heroic amounts of metaprogramming to achieve type stability, which I don't recommend. Um, so some final thoughts. I. The trend seems to be go moving towards um, domain-specific languages built out of macros and other, uh, other powerful parts of the Julia programming language that 
will help us with data management, simulation, modeling, visualization, et cetera. This is not entirely new. You have packages, uh, especially modeling packages for probabilistic programming already, that, and also for mathematical modeling, or yeah, mathematical programming like jump that are really effective. So this seems to be something that Julia is good at, and so probably we'll see more of it in the future. As a statistician, I would really like to see something like this for simulations. I think that would be a really cool thing. And it would be really composable with um, a query base or a, a DSL for data manipulation and then visualization and modeling and whatnot. Um, these packages, along with data streams, abstract tables, and also now stats models such AL are really stripping away a lot of like what data frames was originally built with, uh, which is and and kind of coming to a core notion of what it means to be a tabular data store a tabular data source in Julia. It seems like the most important thing is you're a map from fields to columns that you can iterate over and produce tuples, which is pretty. I mean that's fairly straightforward, but now I think we're getting to the point where having, having found that we can now begin to make uh, a lot more things generic and more powerful. And finally, I, I feel like I see doubts expressed about data frames and Julia statistical computing in general that I can entirely understand. Right, it took a a while for you know, data frames to get to a certain point, and you, know, you had John Miles White writing things like why data frames are still slow you know, years later. Uh, I think there's reason for optimism. I'm hopeful for the future. I think that the people who are doing work now uh, are on the right track, and that's not just you know, flat-handing myself or whatever. I, I think there are people who are working on the stuff who have really good ideas, and I'm excited for what they bring. And I'm not an official voice, so don't take this as gospel, but I think the, the people behind the Julius Sass community, data frames and whatnot, are hoping to put, uh, release this new version of data frames built on top of nullable arrays sometime early next year, and I'd like to plan a more solid release of this package that I've been working on to coincide with that. So finally, that's kind of funny. Uh, I forgot to change code from code to markdown. I'm very grateful too, that's supposed to be a header. Uh, John Miles White <laughs> at Facebook, who was my mentor for this project over the summer, who was my mentor for the Nullable Arrays project the, su the previous summer, and who has been really generous with his time with me, and from whom I've learned a lot of very worthwhile things. Uh, Yizian Ng at MIT, who, had a, who helped me a lot in thinking through this tabular data structure interface and is also writing SQL translation for it and actually getting that off the ground. I'm very grateful to Alan Edelman and Viral Shah, who arranged this opportunity for me to work at MIT over the summer. I'm super grateful for the people at Julia Central who were very patient with my very noobish questions. And uh, I'm grateful to Spencer and for inviting me out here, for y'all for showing up, eBay for hosting. I, forgot, I didn't, I didn't uh, write it down, but I'm also really grateful to Milan for holding nullable arrays together while I floundered in graduate school and drowned in the sea of work and barely kept on track with that. So Milan is doing a lot of work to hold data frames and the surrounding functionality together, and he deserves a shout out. So thank you all. So I understand we have five minutes for questions. Tom. Yeah, so I'm wondering, um, uh, have, you, have you tried to collaborate with, with the end off? Um, like, is it two competing camps? Are you talking? Are you, are you strategizing together? Like, what's the dynamic? Yeah, so uh, kind of both. I feel like I've had uh, a lot of pr really productive back and forths with David. Uh, where like we each point out issues with basically 
I think uh, we agree on a lot of things, and the packages that we're developing are very similar. I think his is definitely more mature than mine, and he recognized the power of a, a link-like functionality more earlier on and seized on that, and I'm definitely now just like catching up to draw inspiration from that. I think the main thing where we differ is our thoughts on lifting, um, the whole nullable strategy. So David is pursuing the method extension approach, and I'm pursuing more this higher order lifting approach. It's not really clear which one is ultimately going to be better. I really don't know. I have my reasons for preferring the higher order lifting approach. Um, but I think it's on the whole a good thing that we have two people doing otherwise similar things, uh, but trying out these two different approaches. And we can have more, you know, not quite a controlled experiment, but hopefully we'll get some data, you know, in the coming year to really see which one is, if not better, then less problematic. And. Yeah, I kind of do feel in competition with him. I mean, like, I, I just, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Query, query.jl is a really cool package. I encourage you all to check it out. And any other questions? All right, let's go get here. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. If you have trash, please take it to the trash and recycling container and go to Ride House on 17th between 5th and 6th. And stay tuned for next month's meetup with all the Fedra and Tom and the Tech Brothers. This is how we're going to do that. Take our one another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I am so, so mic'd up. up. Yeah, it is. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you.